In this lecture, we're going to start moving on now to the idea of supervised learning. And the main concept here is that you're going to provide labels to your data. So you're going to actually have an expert in the loop who can provide information about what the data is and what you're looking at. So that's going to make a big impact on your ability to do uh, accurate classification or clustering, right? Because now you have this insight. The unsupervised algorithms we've talked about so far just had to do this on their own. Now you're providing data with labels. And so now if I give you new data, the goal is to classify it according to what you've already seen. In other words, your training data set. And all the details can be found here at databookuw.com. Lots more lectures. All the code, both in Python and MATLAB, are provided. OK, along with the data as well. So let's get right to it. So I want to highlight a few of the major supervised learning algorithms. And I want to start with some of the earliest and oldest. So here in the supervised learning algorithm point, I want to talk about linear discriminants. This is a really intuitive concept. I'm going to show you this in the data. And also has a very nice mathematical formulation and optimization strategy for, as it sounds, discriminating between different classes in the data. So when you do the clustering and classification, this is going to be based upon a linear technique. OK, so uh, let's get to what this actually is trying to do. So the idea here is to think about projecting all your data onto a subspace. In particular here, this is actually the dog and cat data that we've been playing around with in the wavelet domain projected onto the PCA2 and PCA4 directions. So you can see they have this sort of uh, nice distribution. The green and the magenta do seem to be pretty nicely separated in the sense that you could make a classification decision based upon, uh, based upon something like might be a line right here. The question is, in your mind, you think, OK, I could separate those with a line. How would I generate that line? And so that's what a linear discriminant is going to do, is going to project this into a space where I can get a good line separating the data. So it is a projection. And I'm going to show you two possible projections of this data onto a line. So what you have here is a projection onto this line right here. Suppose I were to project all the data onto this line, what you would see is the magenta at green would have these sort of probability distributions on this line. So you see it doesn't discriminate well between on this line between the magenta and the green. In other words, dogs and cats in this direction, very hard to tell any difference between them when you're on the, this projection. So we call that a poor projection. We say that this is not what we want to be doing. However, there is another projection here. And this is sort of basically an optimal projection. Look at this line here. If I project all this data here, magenta falls onto a PDF here. The green falls onto a PDF there. There's clearly overlap right there in the tails. But this idea of projection where you have nicely separated PDFs so you can draw a decision threshold between them is exactly what we're after in a linear discriminant analysis. The whole goal of the linear discriminant analysis is to give you that optimal line. OK, and you can clearly see for all the lines I could produce, there's a very good one. In fact, the optimal one. And then of course, here, what you have is non-optimal and in fact, very poor discrimination. So let's go about talking about the mathematics of how to produce this line right here, which is, of course, going to be done through optimization. OK, so here's the formal optimization procedure. We think about this data. And remember, the data that I give you is labeled. So I give you a bunch of data of dogs and cats with the labels that they are, in fact, dogs and cats. So I have examples of the magenta and the green balls. So what this allows you to do is compute two key quantities, the in between, the between and in-class variance. So the between-class variance here is basically the difference of the means between these two classes. So you have dogs and cats. And what I would like to do is look at the between class variance. So between dogs and cats, cats. the within class is the variance within the dogs, the variance within the cats. Okay, So these are these two quantities, SB, SW. So SB between class, SW within class or in class. 
And what we want to do then when the formal op optimization procedure is create this vector w. This is my projection w. This is where I'm going to project all my data onto this line right here. And what I want to do is maximize w so that essentially what you have up here on top is that you maximize the between class over the within class or the in class. So I'd like to make this as small as possible, this as big as possible. So this is going to be a, as large as possible. So I want the bottom, the denominator, to be as small as possible. Notice if I have these dogs and cats highly clustered around each other, so the within class or between in class variance is small and they're very well separated, so the between class is big, I'm going to get an excellent score here. Okay, so that is the objective. Find a W so that that's true. Or find a W that it makes it as big as possible, which means I'm going to essentially find the best line possible. So this is just a formal optimization procedure based upon these two statistical quantities relative to your data. And of course you can compute these because in fact I've given you training labels which allows you to make these computations. In fact, this optimization solution to this problem is basically related to a generalized Rayleigh quotient. So if, you, if you've done optimization before, then you see that this has this very nice structure related to uh, Rayleigh quotients, and this is a generalized Rayleigh quotient, and in fact, you just solve an eigenvalue problem. There it is. So you take SB, SW, here is your eigenvalue solution that you would get out of this. So it's a linear solve. So that's very nice. I'm going to solve this line by doing an eigenvalue decomposition. Okay? And the W are the eigenvectors of that matrix, or of this matrix setup here, or this generalized matrix problem. So let's go through some code. I'm going to show you this in practice. We're actually not going to do the optimization procedure. I'm going to introduce you to MATLAB's command for doing this which is under the classify command. And I'm going to show you how it draws you different lines. And by the way, you don't have to project directly onto line. You can generalize this to project onto a parabola, for instance, the best fit parabola. These are, so that's, the, so it's nice that this is flexible enough to give you an architecture where you can do something a little bit more sophisticated than just line fits. So let's go here to the code. So here's the code. I'm going to go ahead and start off again with our example that we've been using throughout this chapter in chapter four, which is I'm going to load in dog and cat data, wavelet domain dog and cat data. Okay, so this is a nice prototype example, very simple. The data set's not too large. You can download the data set and play around with it yourself. I'm going to concatenate this dog and cat data and I'm going to look at the SVD. Now what we've been talking about is in the SVD, if I project all the data onto modes two and four, I get a very nice separation. In fact, I just showed you this picture of this. So that's one of the most discriminable directions that you can get is these two directions of PCA2 and four gives you a nice representation where you can clearly see how to separate that data. And so we're gonna work with those two modes. Okay, so let's come down here and I'll show you how to work this data. All right, so I have a plot up there. We'll show you what that looks like in a minute. It's just going to be the, the magenta and green balls that we've already taken a look at. So what I'm going to do is make a training set. And the training set is the first 60 values of the projection onto the V. And, okay, so there they are. So the first 60, and then when I, so I'm going to take the first 60 dogs, first 60 cats, and I'm going to label them ones and minus ones. So I give you a training data set, dogs and cats with labels ones minus ones. I'm gonna make a test set, which are the remaining dogs, the remaining cats. So I, with, I held out 20 dogs, 20 cats to go test this on. So I'm gonna build a classifier. I'm gonna use a subset of the data, or 60 of the data points, both dogs and cats, to build my model, then I will test it on 20 dogs and cats that were never used in the training process, okay? So I have a test set, training set, labels, and so now let's go use the classify command. And here it is. 
In fact, I'm giving you, I'm going to give you a, a bunch of things here out of this thing. So the classify command in its basic structure is this first line of code right here. In fact, maybe we just focus in on that for a moment because all this is for plotting. Boom, here it is. So what I'm going to do is say classify. I give it the test data that I'm going to try this classification on. But I also give it the training data and its labels. So I give you the training data with the labels and then say, here's a new data set test. Go classify it. What the output is, it gives me the class of that test data. So we can see how this works. There's other things you can pull out of this. In fact, in the classify command, there's, op, there's various things you can pull out of this. But I pulled out coef. Coef is a coefficient of that line fit. So after I've done all this, I want to pull out the line. I want to plot that line against the data. So what I'm pulling out here is the coefficients, the constant and the linear term. And I'm going to plot them using easy plot here on this. So all this here is basically just plotting this thing. Okay. Now, this is a linear discriminant. There are options too in the classify, classify command, which are quite nice. One being quadratic. So do a classify on the test set, given the training and the labels, and use a quadratic discriminant. So this is going to be just like it sounds. It's going to produce for me a parabolic, instead of a line between the data, it's going to produce a parabola between the data. So it's, not much, it's almost no different in code structure. You just give it as an option into that thing. So let's go take a look at what this gives us. So if you run this, here's what it is. Here's, here's, uh, this is the real cat dog data in the wavelet domain. What you're seeing there is the training data. Magenta and green, dogs and cats. And it took that data and it produced this line right here. That is my separation line. Okay? And if I do the quadratic discriminator, that is the separation line right there. Okay? So this is a nice way to be able to clearly see how you might be able to take new data and say, is this our dog or cat? And you could just simply look, project onto the modes two and four of the SVD modes. Am I on this side or this side? And whichever side of that line you're on is the decision of classification. That's how it occurs. Okay, so this is a very simple architecture. Linear discriminants go back all the way to Fisher's work, early work in classifying uh, species uh, of animals and birds. So this is, uh, this is important, uh, a, an important classification technique that is um, very old. And back then, you know, if you could solve just a linear eigenvalue problem, you didn't have a computer to do big optimizations. So this is a very nice technique that gets you a lot of important information very quickly just in looking at this thing here. OK. So this gives us what we want here. The other interesting thing is I can also compute the accuracy of this classifier. And by using a linear discriminant, my error in just this random draw, remember I did a training and a withhold, I'd really have to cross-validate this, is about 82.5% accurate. Okay, But that was for the 20, the 20 that it withheld and the training on the 60. If I randomly shuffle this many times, in other words, do a some k-fold cross-validation, the score would in fact change. So I just wanted to show you that this is something that can come out of the model, is just your, your score of your error. OK, so that is it. Classify is a very uh, powerful code. It actually does, it's kind of like the backslash in the sense that it, there's a lot under the hood, but one of its very simple things is just simply a discriminant analysis, whether linear or quadratic, very easy to use, easy to visualize as I just showed you, so it gives you these nice interpretable results. And in fact, let me just walk through them in a little more detail because I think it's helpful to see these not in MATLAB, but sort of pulled out of the, out of the MATLAB to highlight them. So I just want you to recall that PCA2 and 4 were the two modes we were projecting onto. And if you start to look at how well you do in classification of these, of these images, if I do the 20 withhold, if I withhold 20 images and then do the test on them, if I use the wavelet images, here's how I do. So I get um, a bunch of dogs, five dogs wrong, 
but only two cats wrong. And if, of course, raw images, I get uh, quite a few, actually quite a few cats are wrong because these should be negative one and out of the dogs you get four wrong. So you can see the wavelets do better and you can see I actually do very well on the cats, not as well on the dogs, but this is showing you I'm only projecting on the to these two modes right there. So of all the feature space of the dogs and cats, I say project onto these two features and then you get, you're getting in the 80 plus percentage. Okay, but Here's a, a little moral story about cross-validation. Remember, cross-validation, if you don't cross-validate, I hope you finished that sentence for me, you is dumb. Okay, so I'm going to show you this because now when I do random trials of this, now I'm going to randomly select instead of just the first 60 dogs, first 60 cats, I randomly select. Notice what happens here. I'm all over the place with the accuracy. My, in fact, that 82% was in fact not a good representation of my linear discriminant analysis because in fact I normally get about an average of 70. So if I randomly select 60, test on 20, here's the variability that I get. Notice a couple things here. There are some random draws, here's one of them, where I get 100% accuracy. And really this is all about, I just happen to pick 20 really good uh, randomly, pick 20 very good test sets that just get classified perfectly. I also can get all the way down here below coin flip. So here I'm below 50%. Here I'm below 50%. So you can see you can do quite poorly and you can do quite well. But these, in fact, if you don't cross-validate, it can be very deceptive. So this shows you over 100 trials of random selection and testing. So shuffling that data, randomly select, build a model, test on the remaining data. You can get quite a diversity of results. So what you really want to do in building that model is you might say, I will take the average of all these models for my linear discriminant. So each one of them gives me a line, and I could potentially take all those lines and average them and say, that is my cross-validated line, and you're going to have a much better chance of being right here in the 70% and not believing your 100%, <laughs> and also not believing your 40%. Okay? So... So this is an important chart and also reminder that you should cross-validate. And then this is just the picture again. I've already shown you this in MATLAB, but this is the linear discriminant line between the dog cats, quadratic discriminant line between dog cats. Okay, so that kind of gives you a nice uh, intuitive feel for it. Again, the classify command is very powerful. Uh, in its very basic uses is just producing things like this, but then Classify also has options to do much more sophisticated things besides uh, just your typical linear discriminants. So that is method one I wanted to talk about. And the reason I bring in linear discriminants is because it's probably one of the easiest to understand. It's, uh, it's very uh, simple. It was used quite a long time ago because it was easy to produce since it was comes right from solving for eigenvectors and eigenvalues of this generalized eigenvector problem. And so once you have the solutions to that, which you can work out by hand for small enough data, uh, you can produce your linear discriminant line. So the code that I've presented here, everything else, uh, as well as uh, more lectures on this topic can be found here at databookuw.com. All the code bases available are MATLAB and Python, as well as you can download the PDF of the book here at databook.pdf.